Okay, we're going to talk a bit about types. Um, so, types, in general, types describe how programs can be plugged together. Um, what goes together? So, for example, you know, plus is expecting two numbers. But what do you do if you have something like two plus x, y, z, z, y. This is a string. This is an integer. What's going to happen? Well, in an untyped language, it's perfectly okay. The program might crash and tell you there's an error, or it might do some arbitrary thing. It might say, oh, it's not a number. This one's not a number. Turn it into a zero. Or, oh, Look at the memory location storing the string and interpret that as a, those bits as a number and then add it to two. But whatever it do, does, it is kind of arbitrary because the function two plus, you know, the, the function plus is not defined for strings. It's defined for ints and strings. So there's a slogan uh, that goes something like, um, well-typed programs do not go wrong. And so what does it mean, go wrong? Well, a well-typed program will never exhibit undefined behavior like this kind of thing up here. No matter what you do in this case, it's kind of arbitrary, right? I mean, some things might seem natural to you. You might say, oh, well, make it Make it zero. That's a good answer. But then somebody else's answer might be, oh, well, make it one. Um, so it might even depend on what the operator is. So anyway, um, well-type programs will never exhibit undefined behavior. They won't crash. They won't write to random memory locations. Like suppose that this expression up here was being used to figure out, um, you know, um, uh, an index to into an array. And then this thing here is going to be a memory locate, an address in memory. Who knows? It's going to be some arbitrary thing. It will never allow you to read past the end of a buffer. Now, this would be great if it was completely true for Haskell. It is true for certain extremely, um, well, well-defined languages that are still quite rich in terms of their expressiveness, but Haskell is a bit too rich uh, for this to be completely true, but it's almost true. So, for example, you know, Haskell does not support um, natural numbers, or let's say non-zero integers would be a good one for divides, for checking divides. But Haskell as it stands does not support that. Now there are programming languages with stronger typing systems which can define things like non-zero integer. One thing though that I think is, is missed by a lot of people is that in Haskell, there's really two languages at play and they rarely ever mix. So when you see one of these um, expressions, something T, oh, that's not a good one. T has type tau. T has type tau. You can read it. The, squiggly thing there is a tau and um, it's a Greek letter tau. So if T is an expression in the computational part of the language, that's the part where you write an actual program and uh, then tau is an expression in the type language. So when you say T has type tau, the language for expressing types is not the same as the language for expressing uh, computations. When I say up here that they rarely ever mix, it is possible in a program to specify a type. Like, so for example, 
we could write, for example, plus x colon colon int y equals x plus y. And here we're specifying the type of x in here. Um, I think this is still going to come up. This is still going to come up something like, oh, as long as no, a is a number type, this is going to come up as like an int arrow a arrow a type. If you wanted to force the answer to be an int, you can do that as well. Um, but it's really usually almost never necessary to do this kind of annotating types. The type inference algorithm is very good at figuring out what the types are. So you never have to write this, but you'll often want to say with some code you didn't write or some expression that you're trying to figure out, you may often write down, you know, what's, how do you get tau? You write, you know, colon t to, you know, in, in Haskell, you can write colon t, and in this case it would be t. Maybe I should have made this an e, but colon t for tell me the type of this Haskell expression. And it would come back and tell you some tau. So what are the what is the computational language? The computational language is, is the language that you write programs in. The computational language is the part of Haskell where you actually write code that will be evaluated or compiled. The language for describing types um, is really, well, I mean, when I say initially here, very small. They're the second, I'm sorry, the second language is the language for describing types. And initially, this language is very small. So we can start out with kind of like simple types. And then we can grow it because it's very rich in the end because Haskell allows us to define new types on our own. So the type structure, the, the type system is much, the language for types is much richer. But here are the basic types that you can, this is what I'm calling a simple type language for Haskell. And this is a description um, I'm describing the language down here. Whoops. This part here is the description of the language. And I'm describing it using what's called a BNF style description of the grammar. So this is a grammar for how to build the language of types. And so what do you have in there? Well, you've got primitive types which we call C. And so those are types that you can't describe in Haskell. You just have to make them primitive. So there's characters, ints, doubles, floats. There's a whole bunch of them. There's like, I don't know, int 8, int 16, int 32. Um, there's a whole bunch of different built-in types that are used to sort of bootstrap the language up but there aren't that many of them. Now, um, so we have primitive types, which we're writing as C here for constant types. Um, and then we have type variables, and that's what we're gonna talk about more here. So A is a type variable, and you can think of type variable as being this collection of type names, A, B, C, and sometimes the system throws back at you when you ask about the type, it might throw back a, like H1, I think sometimes, or T and T1 and T2. And there's all different names that come back. But if they're on the, if they occur in an expression over here on the right side of a colon, they're type variables. So we have primitive types, we have type variables, and then we have Cartesian products. So we can describe the type of pairs of types. So if T1 is a type 
and T2 is a type, then if you write them like this, left paren T1 comma right uh, T2 right paren, then that's the Cartesian products of those two types. And we also have the function type or the arrow type. And we talked about the set theoretic definition of a function to sort of give you an idea of what this thing is, is about. But in this language, we're just going to say, look, you can write down any type tau1 and you can write down any other type tau2. Those are types that you've previously built Then you can put an arrow between them. And so it's the same over here for the Cartesian product. T1 and T2 have to be types that you can describe. What this previously constructed thing does is it makes sure that you can't have an infinite type that you have. You can't sort of like say, oh, and T2 is the type, you know, whatever, T3 arrow. Oh, and I'm still defining T3 arrow, T4. You, you always have a finite size type expression and this business of restricting yourself to previously constructed types is what gives you that and then sometimes you want to just take a type and put it in parentheses so like for example when we want to do something like uh we want to say like okay like i don't know like a function from int well let me add the parentheses um arrow bool arrow int, for example, if I really want an input to this thing to be an int arrow bool function, I don't know, this doesn't make much sense, uh, and then I guess maybe like uh, I could return an int. Let's say int bool pair. That seems more useful. So here's a function that is a predicate on int, something like, let's say, even. This is an arbitrary int, say k, and what we're going to do is return a pair k and, you know, true if k is even. So I'm trying to give you, like, an idea of what this type could be referring to, but as a type... <clears throat> expression it's perfectly sensible but to do to write down this type i needed to use these parentheses here around int error bool to make that a single expression so that's what this construction allows you to do is to create all these types now one thing is well, you can use the grammar to tell if an expression is in the language of types. And it's a pretty simple language. So you can more or less usually eyeball it and say, oh, yeah, this is sensible. Like something that's not in the language would be like, you know, a arrow. That expression's not in the language of types because you got to say, oh, I'm missing a type over here. Um, so that's not in there. And but this gives a good little grammar for a language of simple types in Haskell. Now you gotta remember that A arrow B arrow C means A arrow and then the B arrow C is grouped together to the right. Arrow associates to the right. You got to remember that. If you get that wrong, you'll be doing the wrong thing all the time. And remember the the kind of like matching convention that we I didn't mention here is that like F X Y Z means apply f to x, and hopefully that gives back a function that you can apply to y, and that gives back a function that you can apply to z. So the type arrow associates to the left and function application
associate. Oh God, I said that backward. Arrow associates to the right and function application associates to the left. Like this. Those are conventions you really need to remember with this higher order programming. Now, I'm going to put out the um, uh, PDF of these notes. And so I think I'm going to just skip this. But this just shows you how you could use, and you can read it on your own, how you could use the grammar that's given up here to determine that, for example, the type of curry, which was this, really is a type expression. And I mean, to do it, you look and you say, okay, Auro is the topmost constructor in this thing. What do I mean by that? Oh, goodness, I'm going to go aside, but it means like, okay, Auro has two things in it. And this expression could be written like this. As a tree... And so then we have an arrow, and the left one is A, and the right one is arrow, and the left one is B, and the right one is C. So this is a syntax tree for this expression. And to show that this expression, or this syntax tree, is well-formed, you got to go back up and look at the grammar, and it says, okay, look, I have an arrow as my principal connective, that's the, this arrow has a left part and a right part, and tau one in this case, the left part is a comma b arrow c, and the right part is a arrow b arrow c, and then this says, oh, look, is this a type? Well, it's a type because of this arrow, if a arrow B is a type, and if C is a type. And over here, you have the same kind of thing. This is a type if the left thing, A, is a type, and if B arrow C is a type. And all those things are types because A, B, and C are all members, elements of the, the, the type var uh, set. But... What does it kind of like, I, I, a lot of students seem to be having trouble understanding what it means to have a type variable in a type. And I guess in a way, I would think that, you know, maybe the way to say it is like, it, it means essentially the same type of thing. Like if you have a, a program in, I don't know, your favorite language, and you say that I has type int, you declare I to have type int. Well, what values can I take on? Well, it can take on integers. You know, it can take on, you know, minus one, zero, one, two, dot, dot, dot. So I, the value, you know, when you look at what is the meaning of I, it ranges over all the possible integers. And in type, in the language of types, it's the same thing. Type values range over the expressions in the language of simple types. So they can take on... They can be replaced, essentially, or they're equal, or they can take on the value of any other type expression. So kind of like a technical definition here is that, look, if A is a type var, and it occurs, it's in this type expression tau, then you can replace... every occurrence of A in tau by any expression tau 1, but you have to do every one. You can't, you know, you can't replace 1A. So if I have the type like, uh, let's say, A arrow, um, A arrow B, then... 
I can, if I want to say like, okay, you know, let A be equal to int. Well, then I got to do, I got to say int arrow int arrow B. I need to replace every occurrence of A. There's two occurrences of A. And I got to replace both of those by ints and I don't do anything to B. So you can't just change one. I saw someone on maybe a homework or maybe in an email saying like, I don't understand. Like if, if on the type A arrow A, why is that not the same as like string arrow A? Well, it's because you can't replace just one instance. It would be kind of like, um, you know, if you looked at something like, oh, I don't know, like um, AX squared plus BX plus C in sort of ordinary algebra. And then you started thinking about like, oh, well, I'm going to replace this X by, you know, 10 and this one by 11. You can't do that. You need, if you're going to substitute for X, if you're going to replace X in there, you got to do this, use the same value everywhere. Okay. Now, this is looking at that Curry example again and saying, look, you could replace A by int, for example. Uh, replace A by int, and then you get back this. Now replace B by int arrow character. So here's the part also that's a little bit complicated. Any type can be used for B, but you got to do it everywhere. So int arrow character is a pretty big type. But I mean, it, it gets even worse. You could look back at one, this equation up here, and you could say, okay, you know, um, I want to replace A by this type. And that's perfectly okay. That's still going to be a type expression, a valid type expression. Now, it's not okay to replace the first occurrence of A with some type um, tau 1 and not replace the second occurrence of A. Okay, so that's the end of this little lecture about how you do substitution in types and sort of what types are. And next we're going to talk and learn how to figure out what the type um, of a Haskell expression is. But I just want to go back to this idea here that, you know, that types uh, describe how programs can plug together. And that's kind of the crucial thing, you know, like you can't, like if you're, if you're looking at like uh, Curry, uh, which has, you know, A comma B arrow C arrow A arrow B arrow C and you say okay this first argument here you can't give in like for example remember plus has type um, uh, num a a arrow a arrow a the structure of this is different from the structure of this so plus is not a suitable argument for doesn't plug together with curry but you know when we define plus x y equals x plus y in this case plus has type num a arrow a comma a arrow a and this part does have the right structure to match that. And so plus is an acceptable um, plug-in for Curry as the first argument. And the thing to remember is, is that if I say Curry plus, if I plug Curry, uh, if I apply Curry function to the plus function, that thing there has type It has this type, except that now B 
and C are both A's because here A is B, A is C. So this thing here has the type num A arrow A arrow A arrow A. And we're going to learn more in the next lecture about how to derive these types. But anyway, okay, thank you for listening.